Because if you don't know that, if you don't recognize patterns of things that you don't understand, you are a very dangerous doctor. My boss, the head of unit, threatened to resign if I were to be moved. When the cast came out, I started checking. I realized that uh, I damaged one of the nerves, so he didn't have sensation anymore on, on the top and side of his foot. When he came in, he was still alive, but you could see, you know, like foam coming out mm. his mouth and whatever, and we tried to resuscitate him, and we couldn't get him back. And that was one death that, you know, it stuck with me for a while. It was 25,500. Oh. Is it a lot of money? Um, if you are interested in becoming a doctor, my first advice would be... But... Bottom, 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 bottom. What's up, South Africa and nations worldwide? This is your boy Scotty at Uncle Scott at Bottom Pop on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. And we're here on another episode of Bottom Pop to educate all curious minds, young and old, on all topics relevant in our daily life. Um, guys, to anyone looking to become a doctor or a scientist, you're in the right place. With me here today is not just a doctor, but a specialist, a spine surgeon, a man of God. Dr. Chris Chisipudo. Thank you for having us. Thanks, you. Thank, thank, thanks for having me. So, before we get any deeper into this, can you please explain to us what a spine surgeon is? Yes. So, a spine surgeon is a qualified doctor who has gone into medical school for a duration of six years um, to qualify as a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. And then after that, I'm sure we'll go deeper into details later on, but after that, you do your internship, come serve, medical officer time. Then you go into specialize. There's two ways of becoming a spine surgeon. Okay. You can do that via the orthopedic route or the neurosurgery route. And then you have to do at least five years of specialization wherein you are getting training. If I went via orthopedic route, so you train for four to five years, and you qualify as an orthopedic surgeon. During that duration, you get at least six months training of, um, of spine surgery, which is really not enough to acquire the skills to treat and operate in the spine because it is quite a delicate area with a lot of implications. But after I had finished my um, orthopedic training, then I had to do another one year of fellowship in spine surgery, where I was working with uh, qualified spine surgeons who have been operating for years mm -hmm. to then acquire the skills, decision making, and so forth. Okay. So it, it's a long route, but yeah. yeah, we are there. So what's the difference between orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons? So neurosurgeons, they, their training focuses mainly on brain and spine. Okay. And where, when they are undergoing their training, so all of us at this point, we are qualified doctors, mm -hmm. we have done internship, mm -hmm. community service, then we apply to be admitted into specialization. So when you go into the neurosurgery route, you are focusing mainly on brain and the spine. And as a matter of fact, the training itself in public, it entails mainly the, the brain. So all these brain injuries, brain tumors that needs to be operated or treated, mm. they are the ones that treat it. And then also there is part of where they uh, then focus on the spine injuries, spine tumors, and, and so forth. But most of their training focuses on the brain. On the brain. Okay. Uh, whereas on the orthopedic side of things, mm. So their training is four to five years as well. Our training is also four to five years. Okay. So as I'm being trained to become an orthopedic doctor, the word ortho means bone. The word neuro means neurons as in like brain yeah. or spinal cord, okay. right? So ortho means bone. So I get trained in all body systems um, um, that involves any bony injuries or any bony diseases. And just six months, out of, out of that four-year to five-year program focuses on spine. And at that point, mainly you're being taught in terms of making decisions, okay. who needs to be operated, who needs what sort of yeah. treatment, who needs physiotherapy, yeah. and uh, who needs injections and so forth. And when you finish, depending on where you are specializing, 
most of the times you're not qualified, you don't have the skills to go and operate in the spine. So you also need mentorship after that, which some people do six months, 12 months and so forth, so that they can become comfortable in dealing with spine cases. Okay, so being an orthopedic surgeon, it's not just reduced to a spine, like spine only, it refers to all the bones, like including injuries and like, I just wanna like get a, like a pure understanding. Yes, yes, yes. No, no. So being an orthopedic surgeon, as a matter of fact, once you say you are a spine surgeon, people start separating you from orthopedic surgery. Oh, and okay. most people understand spine surgeons as being as being having a background of neurosurgery. Right. Um it's just yeah, it's just because in orthopedics, we deal mainly with broken bones, right? Mm. Or bones that are sick for whatever reason. Yeah. We deal with joints that are injured or sick for whatever reason with age. We deal with muscles, nerves, tendons. Okay. So most of the people who qualify as orthopedic surgeon, once you qualify, you are allowed to treat anything, including spine. But okay. that is one area in orthopedic surgery that usually needs further training oh yes it's the most complicated 100 so, percent. so okay. most people they say and i'm not bragging most people they <laughs> say uh spine surgeon in orthopedic is on top of the food chain if mm. i can put it that way under doctors okay. under Do being a doctor uh, like no, I, I i wouldn't take it that far no <laughs> oh. so um it depends on what you're looking what you're looking for um, there is a say, and I was one of those when I was younger, that um, orthopedics, orthopedic doctors are not the smartest. And the physicians, the physicians are the ones that deals with medical illness. Mm. You know, your heart attacks, your high blood, diabetes and whatnot, mm. that they are the smartest. And there is a lot of truth in that because you have to understand the biology that we all do in, 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 in high school and how the body functions, um, to understand all of that and every little bit of electrolyte and balances in the body, you have to specialize to become a physician in internal medicine to, to really be that guy. Mm. And those are the guys who are most knowledgeable. And also if you talk about the ICU doctors, the ones who are dealing with people who are almost on the other side of life, mm. you know, to understand how to deal and maintain life of someone who's almost on their way out. According to me, I feel those are the, the smartest guys. Mm. And most people, they, I liken orthopedic surgeons to engineers or carpenters, which is very true to some extent. Mm. You break your bone, I put it together, I yeah. fix it, you go home, yeah. you are yeah. healed. You dislocate your joint, I put, put it back, it back, I fix yeah. it. So we are mainly alikened to to engineers or carpenters because we 60 to 80% of what we do, we fix things, which is the reason why I like orthopedics because we fix things. The smart guys, the physicians, they control things if i can put it that way mm. i'm sure you know a lot of people who've got high blood pressure yeah, and diabetes yeah. they still okay. have it today they're gonna die with it when they die mm. but if you come to me with your broken bone i'll fix it and in six weeks you'll be good to go back to work or whatever that you do mm. okay so growing up did you specifically want to be a spine surgeon or did you just want to be like a doctor was that was on your head at the time no, becoming a, a spine surgeon was something that happened or occurred to me in the middle of my orthopedic training. Oh, okay. As a matter of fact, I, I never thought, maybe just to go back to your question, to the beginning of your question, um, once I've decided that I wanted to be a doctor, I thought I was going to be the, a physician. Oh. Because those are the smart guys. Those are the, yeah. And I remember when I was doing my internship and one of the specialists said to me, wow, you, you are very smart. You know, we do pick mm. up on the smart young doctors mm. and we then tell them, you know, maybe you should come back and specialize with us. And I was offered that chance when I was doing my second year internship. And I said, 
no sir i, I still want to be a doctor you know i still yeah. want to think through things and not just fix your bone yeah. kind of doctor but i was young and naive i know there's a lot more to <laughs> that than just fix your bone yeah. uh, kind of doctor so i didn't always want to be a spine surgeon uh, the story of how I wanted to be a spine surgeon was inspired. I, I worked with a, a a certain Dr. Khan and Dr. Okunda, and I joined the unit for two months. I told them that, you know, what, what you guys are doing, it's yeah. evil. I can't, you know, you open someone's bag, yeah. you are, the bones are sitting one other side, ways, the other yeah. side, and then sometimes the spinal cord is this, it's looking at you, the patient mm. is paralyzed, or the patient is not paralyzed, and you know the yeah, risk yeah. that after I do this operation for back pain and leg pain, mm. this patient might actually get paralyzed. So I felt I don't want that stress in my life. I want to go home and actually forget about work, not mm. operate and think, would this patient have a complication? You know, every operation can have a complication. Yeah. But once your spine is operated, and one of the dreaded complications is that you can be paralyzed. You can only imagine the lawyers are after you, the family, mm -hmm. everyone, yeah. especially if that person was working. Yeah. So I felt for two months, I felt that, no, I don't want to do this. Up until one time we were doing a, a scoliosis surgery. Yeah. And scoliosis is this case that you find them with a hump on their back that is caving. Oh, and, okay. And I know in our cultures, we blame it to many things. Yeah. But, yeah. Yes. And <laughs> it has got nothing to do with that, really. Yeah. Uh, are, it's just that when you don't know, you don't know. But So we do offer surgery to candidates who are fitting or who qualify for surgery to correct their backs so that they can be straight. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the most difficult operation and one of the most long operations depending on how bad it is, the ones that are like really, really bad, you are standing, looking into the spine, operating for minimum six hours oh. to eight oh. hours, and you just into it. And we were doing that surgery the first day, second day, and I was like, no, this is too long. And what if things go south? Mm. Until one day when things went south. So we do connect our patients to some machines that tells us about spinal cord yeah. activity. Okay. So when you're doing something, if there's changes in spinal cord activities, one of the things, it could be that you have done something wrong and you need to reverse it there and there. And you know, you read things in the book to say, if you cause harm to a patient, you can actually do one, two, three to reverse the harm. Mm. And that day I just saw a, a, an orthopedic spine textbook come alive wherein we went backwards step by step and we were able to get back the functions because the machine was mm. telling us that we are paralyzing the patient. Mm. So then we had to go back step by step and corrected everything that needed to be corrected. Mm. And that was the day when I was like, I actually want to do <laughs> like, this. And it's such a funny story because most people, they see that they're like, no, I'm mm. running away, but yeah. my story is different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when was your first ever surgery? The first surgery you ever had to like actually operate? And how did you handle that pressure of having to do that surgery? In orthopedics? Yeah. Okay. In orthopedics, it was when I was doing my com com community service back at home. I'm from Venda okay. uh, in Chirizini Hospital. And that being said, Part of the story that we have omitted on my journey to become a doctor and to become an orthopedic spine surgeon is that the point in time wherein I had to change my career plans from wanting to become a physician to orthopedics mm -hmm. was when I was doing my community service, meaning two years of internship, which I did here in Jobek, and then I went home to do community service. So usually in community service, as the word um, self-described, you are placed in areas that are in need because you know mm -hmm. most doctors, they yeah, don't want to go to yeah. the, the outskirts. Yeah. So you're placed in areas uh, that are in need of doctors. And when you are placed in there, you are given, it's a one-year program. For six months, you can ask the clinical manager that I want to do this because of my future plans. The other six months, they place you in the area of high demand like 
maternity, casualty, mm. uh, emergency, emergency rooms, that, uh, so to say. So when I arrived in Chirizini, they placed me in orthopedics. And first day when I got there, we had a morning handover meeting and I walked to the clinical ma- into the clinical manager's office and I told him that, you know what, I don't want to do orthopedics. I want to become a physician. I should not be placed in orthopedics, please. I begged him and he said, you know what, that is the area that is busiest here mm. and I don't have numbers. And at that point, the head of the unit was not there. So he says, just stay there for three months. Then we can see if we can change our plans. But I knew three months was not the prescribed time. Yeah. It had to be six months. So yeah. he was just trying to smoothen me up. Then I stayed in orthopedics. Now coming to your question. For the first month, I was not so convinced. Then um, the first surgery that I did was um, a child who came in with a broken arm oh. just above the elbow. Mm. So bone sitting there, the other bone sitting there. I had seen few being done in that period mm. of a month. I had seen few being done. And then myself and the other doctor that I was working with, we took this child to theater. Uh, patient was put to sleep pulled the bones, put it together, put in some wires to bridge the bone that is broken so that they catch the other side. And uh, we put in a a cast for three weeks. After three weeks, we removed the wires. And then three weeks later, when the child came back, you know, 100%, and that was so satisfying Mm. to see Mm. The magic of what I had just done, you yeah. know, to say, you know, actually, actually orthopedics, yeah. there's, there's more to it. And kids are very honest, you know, if you yeah. have kids, you will know yeah. when they are sick, they don't want to talk, they don't want to eat. Once they are healed, you would wish they were sick again. Like, <laughs> I know I'm exaggerating, but they, they yeah. are so problematic. So it was so satisfying to see that was my first surgery. And then the second surgery was a broken wrist again, did the same thing on a child. Mm. And you see them two months later, they're like, you know, okay, like um, nothing um, happened. Yes, hundred yeah. percent. So, when three months came by, I didn't go knock at the clinical manager's office because I was starting, starting to, enjoy to enjoy myself. Yeah, yeah. And from there onwards, I knew that that was what I needed to do to an extent that I worked so so hard mm. that the head of unit, when it was time to change, to change over at six months, he. He asked me, because he knew that I've decided I want to specialize in orthopedics. He says, you know what, do you want to move or do you want to stay? I said, no, I want to stay. So he told the clinical manager that Dr. Chisikure must not be moved because I have finally found someone who's interested in orthopedics. No one amongst all the people you give me, no one is interested. Mm -hmm. I found someone who's dedicated, interested, hardworking. And I can't be training someone new every six months. Mm. The clinical manager said the rules are the rules. You know, I can't change that. It has to be mm. six months of this, six months of that. Long story short, the clinical, uh, my boss, the head of unit, threatened to resign if I were to be moved. Mm. So I spent the whole year doing orthopedics. And that mm. is where the orthopedic surgeon was born in Chirizin. Yeah. So... When was your first, have you ever failed an operation? Like, have you ever had a failed operation? So, failed operation has a couple of definitions. Okay. Uh, one of the definitions is on the patient's perspective yeah. to say what you came for, are you satisfied? Mm, mm. You know, and then part of the definition is on the surgeon's perspective mm. to say I what I needed to, ach- yeah. to achieve, did I achieve it? Mm. And most of the times the two are aligned, but not always. All, always. Yeah. Sometimes I have done operations where, you know, I was not happy. You look at the x-rays and you're like, you know what, this is not aligning perfectly, but the patient is the happiest. And maybe if I can say what comes to mind is the first ankle operation I did. Now I had moved to Mukopane Hospital. Okay. I was still uh, learning my trade. And by then I was comfortable in many other things. I had not operated on on an ankle. Mm. And then again, it just so happened that uh, I think my boss was sick at that time. And, but there was a couple of other patients in there. 
what I was more comfortable with was operating broken femurs, which are the thigh bones the thigh, and the yeah. tibias, yeah. the leg bones, not the ankle. So patients will come in, I would operate, they go, they are happy. And then there was this one guy who stayed in the ward for almost six weeks because we were waiting for the boss to come, to it's come scary. back, yeah. to operate him. Okay. Myself and the other guy that I was working with, we were not totally comfortable with that operation. Mm. But I had seen it being done. I had read about it. Mm. So this guy kept saying, you know what, Dr. Chisukul, I see you operate. Everyone is singing praise. They are mm. happy with your work. Do my ankle. I said, no, mm. I am not comfortable. I had never done that operation. He's like, no, but I mean, this is a small bone. Other people are coming with bigger bones. Please, please, please. It got to six weeks. And by then, the operation is even more difficult. I took him to mm. theater. I operated him. And, you know, it, it was not a very good operation. At that point, I thought I did well. But you know when you don't know enough, yeah, you, yeah. you think everything is fine. Later mm, on, when I had it. actually learned the art, I realized that that ankle, I didn't do it much Carpet, justice. Yeah. But anyway, long story short, the operation was done. The x-rays were looking okay. -ish. The guy was very happy. Put him in a cast for six weeks. When the cast came out, I started checking. I realized that uh, I damaged one of the nerves. So he didn't have sensation anymore on, on the top and side of his foot. Yeah. But that guy was very happy. Yeah, I was awesome. very depressed. Yeah. I'm like, you know, when you operate, these are the yeah. things that you need to look out for. Make mm -hmm. sure you don't cause injury. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, that guy, every time he comes to for checkup, you'll be like, that's my doctor. He's <laughs> the one who operated me, you know, with a yeah. limp. But... Very, very happy. So I'm just showing you that yeah. sometimes, you know, you can feel I'm not satisfied with mm -hmm. my work. But that guy was happy. He was back doing whatever job he was doing with a limp. But he was just happy that his bones are sitting together and he was managing nice. with the pain medication. Yeah. Mm. So this is just a hot take. Um, your, first, your first surgery, the, when you came out, like in being a doctor, were you getting paid enough for, did you think you were getting paid enough? Like for what you were doing? Like, did you think that now nah, I did this and these people are paying me with what I'm supposed to be getting? So the difference about working in public and in private mm. is that in public, you, you don't get paid what you are worth. Mm. as an individual okay and that could mean either way that you you, you might you probably getting pay, overpaid or underpaid mm. sometimes it might be enough and by that i mean there are people in in public institutions that are hardly ever at work mm -hmm. you know they are pushing locals yeah. and yeah. you know you go to the gps mm. and you find this person that you know they are working at this hospital they are pushing low comes, right? So those people, according to me, they're being overpaid mm. because they're not spending enough time doing what the work that they signed up to do. And then there are people who will stay there and work and go beyond. I remember when we were in Chilizin, we had such a work ethic that, you know, doctors are on call, right? Mm. Uh, when you're on call, you're expected to work at night and whatnot. Sometimes the casualty, the emergency rooms can be so full when there's like taxi accidents and whatnot mm. that one or two people who are covering, they can be overwhelmed. But the way we worked, we were like a small family there mm. that they knew that if a hip is dislocated and whoever is working there can't dislocate it, they'll be like, it's 10 o'clock at night. Chris, are you available? Mm. And then, you know, I'll just go there quickly, help relocate the hip, you know. So I feel those are people who are going beyond than what is prescribed. But bottom line is that when you're in government, you get paid the same salary depending on the notch or the level where you are at. Mm -hmm. So interns get paid the certain salary, commissars, yeah. medical officers. Okay. So... Uh, there's levels. A, a medical officer is an equivalent of a GP. So you can only become a GP, open your own practice after two years of internship, okay. one year of community service. Then if you want and you've got funds and means, you can mm. open your own practice. If not, and you want to specialize, you apply in one of these academic institutions, uh, hospitals, so to say, 
so that they can give you a position which is called MO, medical officer. That is an equivalent of a GP. GP yeah. And then you need at least 12 months of experience in that area where you want to specialize in before okay. they can consider you because they want to know that indeed you are sold yeah. for that. So, and then with that, the salary has, you know, this medical officer grade one, grade two, and three. Grade one is from year one to five, year five to 10, and more than 10 years. So it has to do with experience. Mm -hmm. Everyone in those three brackets, they get paid more or less the same salary. Okay. Whether you're a hard worker or not a hard worker, whether you're operating on bones to come back to your question, or you are just doing whatever you're doing, you know, mm -hmm. you could be working, you could be a medical officer in gynecology and obstetrics. Those are some of the busiest areas to work in. Mm -hmm. And you'll get paid the same as someone who's working in, in less busy areas. You could be working in a hospital like Baraguanath, where it's so, so crazy. Yeah. And then someone is working in a hospital, let's say like uh, Betha Claw, or yeah. smaller hospital. Yeah. And this applies to nurses as well, not just as doctors. But if you're on the same level, it doesn't matter how busy you are, you get paid the same amount. I'm not sure if I've answered I know. <laughs> you answered me, don't worry. <laughs> no, maybe, can I qualify the question? Yeah. Um, I, would, I would ask, what was your first paycheck as a fully qualified doctor, just a doctor? But when I graduated with the internship. Yeah, just, you know, people like to say, I, I want to get that job because of the pay. So yes. what was the first paycheck? I mean, we don't need to know what you earn now, but back then, as a, okay. when you're fully it qualified. Was, it was 25,500. Oh. Is it a lot of money? For the first paycheck, <laughs> not yeah, too bad. First and paycheck was, is pretty good. Yeah, that's and, a... and um, that was many years ago. I know I probably don't look that old, but mm. it was in 2012. Mm. So it things have changed now. Yeah. I'm I'm not 100 percent sure how much the first year interns are getting paid, but it's probably More plus than... 20 yeah. or it's in the 40s of what they are getting. Does that sound enough? No, that's why um, they that's why they can't get jobs. The internships maybe it's too high. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay, they're, they're gonna be very angry with me for that because <laughs> you know medical school is, is very torturous, mm. and they take the cream of the crop from high school and convert them into robots. We, you know, as doctors, you have to be a robot. You do the same thing the same way over and over. You know, perfect. and the, uh, yeah, you have to perfect it. Just be the best version of you in what you do. Yeah. Because once you step outside of that and you try to be a hero, sometimes that's when things go wrong. But I'm just saying that, you know, you would expect them taking the all the A pluses students that you know they're going to create them into these monstrous scientists who are going to change the world. We don't necessarily change the world. There is a part where we change the world, but majority of us, we just keep the world alive mm. the way it is, and we try to make it better here and there. But idea-wise, we usually do what has been prescribed. There are people who are doing studies, new studies every year to say, how can we improve here? Mm. How can we improve there? But that is what it is. I, I, I'm just saying that for being that top of the class student and if you compare it to what politicians are earning and mm -hmm. what they have studied you might just realize that what was i doing i could have been an a tenderpreneur somewhere yes. and not mm -hmm. have to wear, work night shifts and and mm -hmm. whatnot you mm -hmm. know spend time with your family because I mean, those have their own downsides when you're working alone at night and you're the one who have to deal with difficult dying patients and whatnot mm. you know it, it it needs someone who's brave who's strong and willing so what was your biggest challenge in becoming okay let me say a specialist because you're a specialist so what was your biggest challenge in to get into where you are right now um the biggest challenge was the, the i i had a four-year gap from finishing my internship and the reason was that my studies were sponsored by um, the Limpopo province. Back then, when you finish, they had enough posts. Mm. It's either you paid, 
pay back their money or you go and work there for the amount of years they sponsored you. Okay. So obviously that was a barrier to say I couldn't apply to specialize as soon as I wanted to. I had to go work in Chirizine and in Mukopano, which yeah, is in Lipop, up until yeah. I had to come back this side. And then coming back, the biggest challenge that I've experienced, which is becoming worse and worse now in orthopedics and also other spe- areas of specialities, is that the competition is so, so high. Mm-hmm. Gone are those days where everyone wanted to become a doctor so that they can become a GP somewhere mm-hmm. and monopolize that area and make enough money. Mm. There's way too many GPs now and very little special, uh, uh, specialists mm. that almost everyone, their ambition is to specialize when they finish. And that makes the competition to get in uh, very difficult. The guys who went in from, uh, I, I know a few guys who, after we did our ComServe, they mm. applied and they just spent a year or a few months and then they got in. But by the time I, ca- I came back to Joburg, at that point in time, you needed to have written uh, these, what we call primary exams. Okay. It's like to test, do you have enough basic knowledge in orthopedics? Mm. And also they test general medicine knowledge mm. here and there, like your physiology and anatomy, but relating to, to orthopedics. orthopedics. Okay. Uh, so those exams in the past, maybe like before 2010, mm. you didn't need to have any exams when you go in. In your first year, you write the primary exam. In your second year, you're starting your research while you're gunning to write your intermediate exam. So uh, intermediate, obviously, you now is more focused on orthopedics, orthopedics mm. principles, and uh, applications thereof. So then you do that in your second and third year. And then in your, at the end of your fourth year, you can then write your final exams. And then you can be qualified as an orthopedic surgeon. So back then, they were not so keen on research. Things have changed now. And to go back to your question as to what were the difficulties, I knew when I was still in Limpopo that you can't get in if you don't have primary exams. Mm. Because there's so many people who are applying, the minimum you need to have is primary exams, yeah. which I wrote and passed while I was still in Limpopo. When I came, the other exam I knew was that you also need, if you have to be a strong candidate, you need to have your intermediate exams, mm. which is something that people were doing while, whilst they were in the program. But I knew I needed to do that before I get in. The problem is that to write the intermediate exams, you need to be in an institution that is qualified to train orthopedics, okay. and you need to have done at least uh, and ICU, or, or oh, yeah, and ICU. Okay. So you need to have done at least three months of ICU okay. time in an institution that is an ICU that is recognized. And also you need to have done orthopedics. I think orthopedics is 12 months. Yes, 12 months orthopedics, three months ICU, okay. three months in, in trauma, like emergency, like emergency serious, areas. Serious okay. Yes. Okay. So in Limpopo, by then, we didn't have any uh, accredited ICU facility. Mm-hmm. So orthopedics, the hospital where I worked in like Pulukwane and, 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 uh, and uh, Mukopane, mm-hmm. we had a specialist, we had specialists there who were qualified with research. Those who are the only ones who are recognized in terms of training. So at least when I came through, I knew that my orthopedic training was fine. I just needed ICU and trauma time, which is three months here, three months there, okay. to write the exams. If I could help it, I would have written everything while I was still in Limpopo. So that was the barrier. When I came back this side, applied to become a medical officer in orthopedics. Mm. And only after six months, then I was given an opportunity to go rotate three months ICU, three months uh, uh, trauma surgery. And then I applied to write my exams to then be considered for orthopedics. So, yeah, I felt that that one year and a half mm. of medical officer time is something that I could have um, gotten a head start while I was still in Limpopo if there were facilities to train me. So that was the biggest hurdle in terms of trying to get in. Okay. But, yeah, once I was in, in the system, 
it was just a matter of time. Mm. So did these did these challenges ever make you feel like you don't want to do medicine anymore? Like I want to leave these things. Like everything is just too much for me. I call this the value of despair. This little part where you feel like giving up. Okay. So your question, if I can rephrase it, is addressing two things. Because quitting medicine is something altogether, and then quitting orthopedics, you are. You focusing on medicine as to the challenges that I've experienced in my oh, career, okay. have I, or both of them? Mm. Okay. So in terms of quitting medicine, the answer might be the same. Let, let, let's let's start with quitting medicine altogether. The answer is a no and a very big no. Mm. I'd never felt like quitting. Okay. The only time that I felt like quitting was before I got into medicine. I was not fortunate enough to be accepted into medicine coming from high school, which is a challenge that most matriculants are going to experience mm. and maybe at the end if you can just give me five minutes or so i can just tell them mm. on the ins and outs as to how to prepare themselves and what to expect but i was not fortunate enough to be accepted into medicine the first time coming out of metric okay. i had to go do uh, a bsc degree in uh, biomedical sciences physiology and anatomy mm. and once that was done, I then had to apply at VETS. They've got this program called Graduate Entry Medical Program, okay. wherein if you've got a degree and first year uh, biology-related course, physics and maths, okay. then you can be accepted into third-year level medicine. You start, I started medicine into third-year level. Okay. So... Even whatever degree you've done, that's what they say. Whatever degree you've done, if you can be able to get first year level physics, um, mathematics, and, and a biology related life science course, mm. then you can qualify. But your marks, if you're not coming from a Bachelor of Science degree, let's say you're coming from engineering. We had a guy who came from engineering in my class, and one guy who came after me was an accountant. Mm. So he just made sure that. Uh, via UNIS or other correspondence, they had these first-year courses. So to come back to the time where I felt like quitting, mm. after three years of BSc adverts, I felt that those three years had drained me and I couldn't do four years of medicine, starting from third year to sixth year. And at that point, um, I didn't want to do medicine anymore. I decided to do other things. I actually had a gap year in between, mm, and that's when okay. I decided that, you know what, I'm, I'm being stupid. I need to go back to the original plan mm. of becoming a doctor. And once I was in there in medical school, first year was very difficult. Mm. Uh, first year, which was my third year. My first, yeah, my first year was third year medicine. Okay. It was very difficult, but from there onwards, everything was smooth and... Yeah, and once I became a doctor, there was never a point in my life that I felt that I needed to quit. We had days wherein, you know, like on call, there's few things that I still remember, you know, mm. um, like the first death. It was actually three deaths in one night when I was doing oh. my first call mm. that I had to go and deal with and work with. Mm. And I just realized that, this is tough, you know. I thought yeah. I'm here to save lives, but... But not all lives can get saved. 100%. Mm. But I didn't feel like quitting. I just didn't understand how the system was working oh, as to... Okay. Because when you're on call, you're not only covering your patients, you're covering everybody else's in that department who is at home. Mm. So you have to see patients who are being seen by other people that you don't even know of. Mm. But usually when there's someone who's very sick, before people go home, they will hand over and say, We've got a sick patient here and there that you have to watch out for. But that night I had three deaths. And by the time I got to all three of them when I was called, mm. they were already gone. Oh. You know, the first one I'm like, okay, maybe not. But I could see that according to the knowledge that I have, this person yeah. is gone. So I try, yeah. you know, to resuscitate, to resuscitate give all yeah. the drugs and whatnot. And then when I'm done there, I'm getting another call and three deaths. The following morning I asked my seniors, I'm like, what is happening here? Like, mm. Like, They're like, you know what, these things happen and those people were very sick, blah, blah, blah. Calm me down. 
and then we move on. And the other one was I was working, doing outreach during my internship time, and a young boy came who was my younger than me, younger than me, yes. I, he was 23. Yeah. He came in, and when he came in, he was still alive, but you could see, you know, like foam coming out mm. his mouth and whatever, and we tried to resuscitate him, and we couldn't get him back. And there was one death that, you know, it stuck with me for a while mm. because it's a young person, you know, you don't expect, yeah. you see yourself yeah. in this person, yeah. and this person was okay in the morning. The family says that he called and said he had headaches and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, when they checked him later, he was unconscious. They brought him in, and it was on the last hour, and unfortunately, we couldn't get him back. But even that, I never felt like quitting. To me, all these situations or circumstances just brought more questions to oh. say, how can I then make myself, put myself in a better position mm -hmm. that I can be able to help? and. The reason why I wanted to be a physician really was, you know, physicians are the ones who understand these things very, very well. Mm. And I wanted to apply my brain to say, stretch it to the maximum mm. and use it to the maximum capacity so that I can see how, you know, we can come up with solutions to such things. And becoming a specialist in whatever you're specializing in actually gives you that advantage to say, if you are a specialist, you know, uh, um, you are that last resort when things are yeah. going wrong in your yeah. area. And that was one of the ways that I knew I needed to specialize so that I can be able to offer the best help. In orthopedics, when you're specializing, and it's not just orthopedics, but it's mainly in surgical fields. So you talk about general surgery, orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, mm. all these general fields, they are very tough in, in the sense that your seniors uh very mean if i can put it yeah. that way you know like you are treated like a child and sometimes you know some people they are in there they are married they've got children and they speak to you like you're a child in in such a way that if your wife was there or if you are dating someone there in mm, in that room in that and who's yeah. specializing with you you know, you you like speak with authority at home, maybe mm. with your wife, yeah, let's do this, let's do that. You make the plans. But when you're at work, they speak to you like you're a child. And it's demeaning in a way. It's something that must change. Mm. It's still there. It's much, much better because when I was training as a medical student and an intern, it was worse. It is getting better. That old generation that yeah, believed that... that you need to be harsh and mean to in order for someone. someone yeah. Yes. And they felt like you owe them. They are teaching you. You owe them. And then they have to be harsh. You have to put up with that mm. so that you can get their knowledge. It mustn't be like that. And as a matter of fact, them being in that position, they get paid. Well, I'm one of them now. <laughs> we get paid to teach yeah. medical students. We get paid to teach registrars who are specializing. So, and it doesn't have to be in a mean and a demeaning uh, manner. Do you, feel, do you feel good that, like, self-validation that you were able to get to this level and say that I'm going to make a change for the people that want to learn, for the people that don't, like, want to deal with having harsh bosses, like you say? Like, do you ever feel like, like, yeah, I did something as a person, like, now I can teach this person without having to be harsh? or like having to be strict or anything and they still learn? 100%, 100%. I, I feel very fulfilled. And, you know, those who have worked with me will know, and my juniors especially, they will mm. know that I have always had this thing in me. I don't know if it's because my mom is a teacher, but I've always had this thing in me. I, I, I love teaching. Mm. Like... I could be done for the day and I'm about to drive home and the student says, doctor, you know, I saw this patient, this, this and that. And I'll be like, okay, quickly, let's go through it. But that quickly might end up being 30 minutes because I can see the need that I need to explain and clarify. And also with the, uh, when, when I was specializing, especially, you know, medical students, especially because I'm, I'm, I'm a VC through and through. Mm. I okay. did my studies here 
my under my first degree, my medicine mm. degree, my internship. I came back. I specialized here, so I know the system in and out, and mm. I know where the deficiencies are, and how much sometimes you know, as a doctor, you just want to leave, and medical students they've seen a patient, they a patient they want to present to you so that you can teach them. And so that they can get their logbook signed mm. and be marked to say they've done enough. And usually the more senior you become, the lazier you are to teach the students. You know, like you just want to sideline them, but you are forgetting that if you don't teach them, no one else will. Mm. And, you know, mm. they're going to be deficient doctors mm. in the future. So I, I, I feel very fulfilled that, especially when it comes to orthopedics, um, that, you know, I can give back. When I was in medical school, the guys who were classes behind me, you know, like I would give them tutorials. I was still a student, mm. but the guys who are class, a class or two behind me will sit down. I'll give them tutorials, prepare them to say, you know, in this section, this is what they ask. Mm. This is how you must prepare. Look at this material. And it never stopped during my internship and throughout my career as well. Mm. So... Do you, which areas do you think in orthopedics lacks the like lacks doctors the most? Like, which part needs the most attention right now from your perspective? In terms of number numbers, it's spine. The spine. And okay. this sit back to the reasons that I told you before that mm. I think and I majority of people in orthopedics they know that spine is top of the food chain mm. in orthopedics. Mm. It's very difficult, very demanding, Delicate, and yeah, yeah. you have to be very strong mentally. Mm. Um, yes, and that is why in, in, in orthopedics, the spine surgeons, they pay the highest, um, uh, the highest amount in terms of medical malpractice because we know if someone who's most likely to be sued and to be sued a lot of money. Yeah. It's me whom, if you've got back pain or you've got weakness of your leg and something, and I operate in your spine, and next thing you can't walk or you are worse, mm. you know. So we, we pay a ridiculous amount of money to medical mal malpractice so that at least we can be covered. So there's not a lot of people in, in spine surgery. Um, oh. Can I ask, so how do you deal or what do you use to deal with pressure, with all this, where firstly, you don't want to have sleepless nights, mm -hmm. plus the malpractice. How do you deal with all that? Like, how, what do you do to deal with it as a, like an individual when you are alone? Like, yeah. Okay, so there are several ways to deal with pressure. And one way is, and I'm going to start from the basics, it, it depends on your individual character as a person, how you grew up, how you handled pressure growing up in general. I'm, I'm, I'm very calm. I'm a very calm person. And, you know, those who have worked with me, they will know, you know, sometimes you are faced with a very high pressure moment and I'm, I'm, I'm the calmest voice in the room. You know, mm. let's do that. Let's do this, and and yeah. So, so to say. So, in terms of basics, but this has to do a lot with the way we are raised. You know, as to maybe were you given a lot of pressure mm. uh, growing up to perform. Mm. You know, I know I'm going more into the psychology side of things, but mm. there are, there are those kids who outperform everyone, but they are still the most anxious. Because they feel no matter what they do, they they are not judged the same. It's not good enough. I didn't have that pressure growing up. Then the other thing it has to do with your background in terms of culture and faith. Um, you know, I I pray, and I pray for my week for my operations to say you know like I, I've got a culture when I'm scrubbing to go operate. In my mind, I'm not praying out loud, but in my mind, I'm focusing on what I'm going to do. It's just, you can call it a ritual. Other people, they will do whatever they're doing, but that does help you to calm before you go do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the most important thing of all for me is 
knowing what you're going to do and knowing what not to do, what may go wrong, that is very important because if I explain to you that you need an operation, these are the reasons you need an operation. If you don't have an operation in few months or few years or few days time, this is where you're going to find yourself. If I operate you, chances are that we're going to stop that or we're going to reverse that. If, if I operate you, there are risks that this and that can happen, but these are the steps that I will take to mitigate those risks. So usually I find that if you explain this to people, then we make a decision together. We take a risk together, but that doesn't mean that because I explained to you, I'm just going to go and mess mm. up because with malpractice, they look at what a reasonable doctor would have done under that circumstance. The complication that you are having, that the patient is having, is it something that is described? Did I take all the necessary steps to avoid that? And if yes, then you are safe, right? You have caused complications. A reasonable doctor would have taken the same steps that you have taken. Then it was out of your hands. It was bound to happen because these things are there, they are described that there are such such complications. So that gives me the calmness to say, and that's why going back to that story that I told you how I decided mm -hmm. to become a mm -hmm. spine surgeon, because it never made sense in my mind, how are these guys operating in a spine on a patient who's asleep? Mm -hmm. What if the patient wakes up paralyzed, you know? Yeah. And although I've read these things that you can actually look into ways and act much sooner to prevent further or permanent damage or to mm. reverse the damage. When I saw that come alive, I realized that, okay, you know what, anything that I can have control over, I'm more comfortable doing. Although you know, whatever you do in life, there's always a risk that you can fail. It doesn't mm. matter. It's not just medicine. Mm. It's just how life is. There's a, always that risk that things may not turn out the way you plan them to. But if you know how to if you are comfortable and confident in doing what you need to do in order to achieve a certain goal, I feel that you can do it with peace in your heart. Mm. So from your, from your perspective, what would you say is the best part about being like a, a specialist, a spine surgeon? Um, the best part about being a specialist is that uh, first of all, you earn respect from your mm. peers. Mm. Mm. You know, the very same people that treat you like garbage when they are training you. Yeah. Now you have finished your spine surgeon and maybe they are doing arthroplasty or they are doing trauma, orthopedics, or they are doing hands or um, mm. uh, sports like knees and whatever. Now, when they've got a spine patient, a patient or they have a query about something spine related they mm. call you and ask for your opinion so mm. number one you earn your respect as a specialist mm. and not just from not just from the your peers, peers in yeah. in the same field mm. from other fields as well if a physician has a patient that has got a back problem problem or back pain that they can explain they will call you as a spine surgeon and say, you know what, we have looked into everything. We've exhausted our avenues. Can you please come and look at this patient? Because we don't know what is happening. So you mm. earn a respect amongst your colleagues, mm. your peers. And, and again, you can be confident doing what you're doing because you are the one with the highest level of training mm. to do what you are doing. Mm. So, for example, I finish as an orthopedic surgeon. Some people, what they do usually, they just attach themselves to other spine surgeons in private and they learn that way. And the route that I've taken, uh, there are other, there are institutions that have what we call fellowship, wherein when you finish specializing in whatever mm -hmm. that you specialize in, orthopedics is divided into six, if not seven, subdivisions where you can focus in either one of them. But once you qualify and you're an orthopedic surgeon, you are qualified to do any operation across orthopedic division. The question is, can you do the operation? 
And that is why they need to say, you know what, I need to spend a little bit more time. Now I'm not worrying about research. I'm not worried about passing exams and this and that. I'm just there to learn from this guy's mind. That was my, my thought process when I went to Spine Fellowship. I look at my bosses. I'm like, you know what, these guys, the way they think about things, I see x-rays, I see a patient, and I'm like, this is what I would do. And I'm so confident that is the right thing. And then they start mm -hmm. opening your eyes to say, you know what, it's a There's lot more, more than it, that. Yeah. Yeah. you have to consider this and that. And I'm like, you know what? I need to learn this guy's brain. I know operating, you know, with time you mm -hmm. learn, you can get yeah, it. But yeah. the most important thing about specializing is decision making. Decision, it's all about decision making because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you're working. You could be an intern. You need to know when things are above your pay grade and call your seniors to say, you know what? I need help. I need help. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know that, if you don't recognize patterns of things that you don't understand, you are a very dangerous doctor. Mm. So, so yeah. do, do neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons sometimes swap patients? Like, yes, yes. Oh. So in, in the past, they used to say, um, they used to say that, okay, let me not start there. So orthopedic surgeons, in, as a general concept, mm. they deal mainly with the bony part of the spine. Mm. Whereas the neurosurgeons, they deal mainly with the brain and the spine. The, 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 the spinal cord itself. A spinal cord is like it's a tail inside, or an extension yeah. okay. of the brain, which is inside the, the, spine. the, like the in spinal the bones, bones themselves, yeah. the skeleton, yeah. yes. So that is the general concept. And the places where orthopedic surgeons don't venture into is if a patient has got a tumor of the spinal cord itself, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go and touch that tumor and try to operate on it. Because that's a neural part. That's the neural part of it. Unless if all you need to do is to decompress, because usually what tumors do is as they grow, they start pressing on the nerves, on the spinal cord, and, and other it. things, okay. and they're pushing. So usually one of the operations you can do is to go remove some of the bones so that the spinal cord that's being pressed has free space. That yeah. I can do. But if the tumor is coming from within the spinal cord itself, it has to be dealt with by I the neurosurgeon. Okay. And if a patient comes in, and the perfect example would be the scoliosis patients. Okay. If the patient comes in with a very funny deformity, one bone is missing or it's half bone mm. and then their spine is curved into different angles. Mm. The neurosurgeons find that very difficult to deal with the deformity part which is coming from the bone and that's where the spine surgeon comes in. Into play. Okay. So, but we overlap, you know, and people are moving away from that a concept of saying that the spine surgeons the orthospine surgeons only do this and the, the neurospine surgeons only do that. We are overlapping quite a lot. But as I said earlier on that, it's a matter of knowing your deficiencies as a neurosurgeon to say, you, a neurosurgeon to say this part, I need an ortho doctor to help me with. And it happens a lot. You know, sometimes neurosurgeons, they refer patients to us then likewise, we refer patients to them to say this beyond our pay grade. Can you please deal with this? And then the, but these things works a little bit different when you compare private and public. In okay. public, most of the training that the neurosurgeons have is on the cranial work, the brain okay. and the skull. Yeah. But when they go in private, most of the work they do it in the spine. In the spinal cord. And then with orthopedics, um, I can say we do get we do get enough training in terms of the spine work that we do on the bony part, mm. and we find it much easier to do the bony work than the neurosurgeons initially. Okay. But with experience, you know, we they all come, come to together. the same level. Uh, as time goes. So I'm, 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 I'm saying, you know, if you compare me, I qualified last year as an orthopedic surgeon. Mm. So when you start off, part of the spine surgery has to do with almost everything that we do, 95% or more, 
you have to instrument, you have to put screws in the bones of this of the spine. And while you're doing that, you have to make sure you're not touching, touching the, the nerves and the and spine. Yeah. The neurosurgeons initially, they find that very difficult. Their operations are much, much longer than ours because they spend a lot more time, like an operation that we're doing in two to three hours, sometimes they can spend five to six hours doing the same operation just because that first part mm. where they need to instrument the spine bones, it's so difficult. And to understand that concept is so difficult for them. But mm. as orthopedics, or the other thing I wanted to mention is that the general concept, this, people say that orthopedics are screwers, mm. orthopedic spine surgeons, they are screwers. And uh, neurosurge, uh, spine surgeons, they are decompressors. Because we are so good in, like I said, you know, when I learned, you know, I'm putting in wires, I'm putting in screws on other areas. That gives you an advantage even when you get to spine because you understand the concept of putting screws and metals into the bones. So for them, when they finish, they don't have enough experience of putting metals, screws, and rods into the bones. But when you qualify as an orthopedic surgeon, you already have that experience from everywhere else in the body mm -hmm. where you're putting in screws and so forth. So that's just the difference. But um, yeah, we collaborate quite a lot. So I've got a recording of somebody. So this is not like a consultation. It's just about the screws situation. Can you just bear with me for a second? Um, the first question you can ask the surgeon would be, uh, obviously post the post the operation and after you've healed, say about a year later, then you still feel some some sort of pain uh, where the operation was. What's causing that pain? Um, we've always assumed that it's been caused by cold weather, you know, in most cases. Uh, but maybe if you can just get his expect. Uh, his professional uh, uh, answer to say post the surgery what really causes the pain after you've done the surgery yeah? that's one and then secondly you can probably ask him Hori, um, you know of someone that has done this spine operation at the lower part of the spine um, and there, there are screws that are put in there how durable are those screws to hold is there no way that they can unscrew themselves to a point that okay maybe not immediately but after certain years like 10 years or so um is there no danger in, in the long term to say uh, the screws that are put in there will still be as effective as all right so there were two questions the first one was about pain when one has had an operation in the spine. And that question relates to any other orthopedic surgery to say, what happens? Why are we feeling pain? Especially when it's cold, why are we feeling pain? And the second question has to do with the screw, the durability as to how long do they last? And um, yeah, so with regards to the first question, the answer has to do mainly with blood supply. So, you know, when you're doing an operation, you are cutting through skin, through muscles, and little uh, blood vessels in there. And when, when the healing happens, usually you just see the healing that is happening on the skin, and you can yeah. see there's a scar on the skin, but there's also a scar inside on the muscles and, and, and so forth. So that is part of what causes pain later on, especially when it's cold. Mm. And the reason is because when it's cold, you might realize your hands become more white. Yeah. The reason yeah, the hands have become more white when it's cold is because the body shunt all the blood from the extremities to the core because the important parts of our body is the heart, mm. the lungs, the brain and whatnot. The hands are not so important at that period. Mm. So all the blood gets shunned to the core of the body. So, and that is why sometimes you can, you know, cold, when it's very cold, it can be painful. You yeah, know, like your hands yeah, are like freezing. Yeah. And that Can't even hold a pain. Yes. Yeah. The reason is because you don't have enough. That, that pain, we call it ischemic pain. Ischemia Ischem means less, lack of blood supply. 
So when one has had an operation, and the perfect example is if you know of anyone, any woman who has done a cesarean section, you ask them five years down the line, seven years down the line, do you still feel pain when it's cold? They will tell you yes. And the reason is because when it's cold, there's less blood supply that goes through that area. And when you've got less blood supply, you feel pain. So it's not just about orthopedics and the screw that is in there that is causing it's the pain. Some people, general. they say, I feel cold. The screws inside, I can feel them. I'm telling you, it's the truth. They will say I can feel the coldness because of the screws. But the biggest explanation is not really the screws themselves. It's because of blood supply. And the perfect, perfect example is when, if you eat now, mm. like you destroy a mountain of a plate mm. and you run, yeah. you're going to have tummy ache. The, cramp, yeah. the reason you're having those cramps is because when you start running, your body tells you that you are running. The most important thing at that stage is your muscles. Mm. Your muscles need more blood supply to supply more oxygen to the muscles so that you can be able to run. Mm. So it means that when you're running, the body says, your time is not important. You're running. Why is it important? So, so take all the blood the that oxygen. was supposed to go to the time and other areas, take it to the muscles so that we have enough oxygen to the muscles to run. Mm. And then... Now that you don't have oxygen to your time, you get tummy cramps. That's what happens. And then you run, you run, you run, depending on your training. Now, it, the body comes to a point where you're taking away oxygen and, oxygen and blood supplies from other vital areas. And mm. the body says, oh, no, no, you know, the brain still needs more. The heart needs more mm. as well. Mm. So it try to redistribute the blood, blood supplies. Mm. And then the muscles are getting less and less then you start cramping on your muscles, yeah. right? Mm. And part of that explanation of cramping on the muscles is also the buildup of lactic acid. But basically, what I'm, the point I'm trying to highlight is that when you've got less blood supply to a body region, if that body region has nerves that mm. supplies it, it will feel pain and it manifests in different ways. And that should answer the, the viewer's question with regards to why am I feeling pain? And uh, especially when it's cold. Now, going to the second question about the durability. That I can answer it in two, two ways. Whether the operation was perfectly done or not. And how the recovery of the operation was. Some people, you operate on them and they feel good. And you tell them that take it easy for this certain period. But because they're feeling good already and maybe they were so much pain for so long, they, they are too excited mm. and they start doing movements and heavy duties too soon that they put pressure on the operation. And what happens is that um, all the operations that we do, we hardly, hardly ever remove any of our implants unless if the implants are not well positioned or so if they're in the joint or if we are operating on a child who is still growing, then we have to remove those things to give bone a chance to, to grow. And the reason we don't remove them is because the screws and the bone, they become one over time. So what happens is that when you have that screw in the bone, there is a bit of blood around there because you've put in a screw. That blood, so a broken bone will always heal. So that area where you've put in a screw, you've created a hole, but with a metal inside. So that initiates a cascade wherein the bone is going to start growing into the screw. If a screw has holes, it will grow inside the screw if, you know, if there's mm. holes. So the two becomes one. And as a matter of fact, you don't feel the screw. You're not supposed to feel the screw once the operation is healed. And it's the same concept as when you are walking, you know that you've got bones on your mm. foot, mm. but you're not consciously thinking about which bone is on the, yeah. on the floor now. Yeah. Everything is, is just natural. Just when natural, the screw yeah. and the bone has become one, you don't feel the screw. That being said, some of our operations, especially the arthroplasty where we do joint replacements, those ones we know, uh, if you're talking about the hip and the knees, usually 
the hips is about 20 years time or so if you do a hip replacement after 20 years it might start if it was perfectly done it might start giving you problems then the knee 15 to 20 years the shoulder 10 to 15 years something like that so that is why usually when we talk about doing the uh, joint replacement we want patients who are much older so that you don't have too many revisions if we do a hip replacement on someone who's 30 years old, we know when they're 50 plus. More. And when you're younger, you're most likely going to go back to hard labor and whatnot. And yeah. the more you're doing hard labor, you're stressing it, and then it gets damaged much sooner, even before that 20 years. So preferably, most of the times when we do joint replacement or the commonest indication is arthritis in the joint. Arthritis is a disease of aging. Mm. And, you know, if you're doing it on someone who's 60, they are not so active anymore. You know they're going to last 20 years or so with it. And by that time they are 80, they can decide whether they want another operation or, or just pain just medication and whatnot. Yeah. And I'm talking about operations that are well done. If the operation is not well done and is causing problems, we as doctors always have ways to look into it. We do x-rays to check is it loose. Because if it becomes loose for many reasons, mm. one of them can be infection there or too much activity, or if it was not properly placed, that the biomechanics that are going and the forces that are going through mm. those metals are not balanced, then it will become loose with time and that will cause pain. That is a reason for us to go back and remove the implants. Mm. That's pretty interesting. So do you have any advice for anyone who is aspiring to be a doctor or like in, in the field that you are in? Do you have any? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just starting when you are young in high school and especially on kids who are in, 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 in other provinces outside of Gauteng, Um, if you are interested in becoming a doctor, my first advice would be during school holidays, um, go to the hospital nearby to the clinical manager there, ask for permission to shadow a doctor so that you can see what they are doing. You mm. go in, it is allowed. You go in areas like casualty in emergency rooms, you see patients who are coming in with ambulances, see what doctors are doing. Because some people, they just have this concept of wearing a stethoscope, mm. uh, scrubs, yeah. and money, which you guys think is a lot, but doctors think it's not a lot. <laughs> And they feel that they want to be a doctor, but you you have to fall in love with medicine. And the best way to fall in love with medicine is seeing the magic of medicine at play. When you see what we're doing and you feel, I want to do this so that I can help someone who is in need of that help. That is the first step. The next step is you try to get good results in your grade 11, because when you apply, Application to medical schools in South Africa always closes on the 30th of June. So they use your grade 11 marks to gauge your standard to say, will this person possibly make it or not? And some people, sometimes you can have personal problems and whatnot and not perform well in grade 11. That will work against you. And if it does work against you and you pull up your socks and you do very well later on, once they ignore your first application, they don't take late application. Mm. It is very, very difficult. You need to have really passed like all A's and stuff mm. like that to be considered if your grade 11 marks were not good enough. So first of all, grade 11, the, they, they want you to have done well in English, maths, physics, uh, life sciences. And what, what, if you're doing another home language, you know, to, to have done well in that. So you apply uh, before June when you are in metric. There's a test that needs to be written. It's called NBT, National Benchmark Test. Mm -hmm. You have to write that. You apply online. And for vets, I know that the closing date for that year when you're in metric, it's August. So you have to uh, have done that test in August. Each and every month, They've got a couple of tests that they are 
that they are, are running in all the provinces near you. If you're a South African, there must be a place near where you stay, where you can be able to apply. If you just go NBT, so N for Nelly, uh, B for Bravo, T for Tango, nbt.ac.za, you can look up that test and you apply. They've got a schedule on, online there where you can check uh, when you can apply and write. And you need to pass it, and you have to pass it very well. Because that is another way where if your grade 11 marks were not good, they're going to look at that, as it says, is national benchmark to say, how did you perform? And you should not be getting less than 70% uh, in that. So it's, it's two exams. One of them is math. One of them is just basics about grade 12 stuff, just okay. mixture of everything. Mm. Minimum is 70. You need to do very well. Yeah. That, that is yeah. just a minimum. But, you know, when you look for minimum um, in this day and age, it doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah, you and shine, huh? if I have a minute at the end, just remind me to just talk about medical schools availability because we don't have enough, right? Mm. Just remind me on that. So, um, so you have to write that test and then you have to pass your metric. When you pass your metric, they look onto your marks and when when I qualified then they were saying you need to have gotten 60s and above minimum. Now the standards have gone so high. Mm. But they do look into color, they look into the kind of high school you come from. You know, back then we used to call them Model C's and, yeah. and whatnot. Now they call them Quintel this and that. But basically if you're coming from a disadvantaged high school, uh, you need to be achieving at least 75% uh, for your math, science, English, mm. and uh, life uh, life sciences. Mm. And that's a minimum. If I were to advise any anyone, I would say get 80s. You know, then mm. they've got a very big decision to make. Mm. But minimum 75. For the guys who are coming from your top schools, high schools, then it's 85% and above. That's mm -hmm. what you must be earning in your metric in order to be considered. Future doctors, please pay attention. <laughs> this is very important for you guys. Yes. So once you have gotten those marks, your national benchmark test is done and you've gotten the marks and you are accepted, then you can go in. But most people will still have very good marks and not be accepted. And you need to know the ways around. And my advice is don't apply to only one medical school. Apply to as many as possible. That little money that you're worried about, just force your parents to pay that, I don't know whether it's 300 or whatever, application fee. Please, please do apply to as many universities as possible. And the advice on that is that if it doesn't work out, you need to apply for other courses in the medical field that will prime you into going to medicine later on like I did. You know, you go do your BSc or your nursing, mm -hmm. your physiotherapy, occupational therapy, dentistry, uh, th th those kind of uh, degrees. Because if you do those, you've got enough background mm -hmm. to then apply into medical. As a matter of fact, Medunsa have got an extended program for those who just missed out on qualification. So if you apply to Medunsa oh. and your marks were just there borderline, they've got an extended program. So meaning it's, that you will, instead of six years, it will end up being seven years for you. Oh, so it's like a bridge course. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And then a place like Vets, they are now going into how the American do medicine. In America, to apply, mm -hmm. you don't just apply to medicine when you come out yeah. of high school, so to say. You go into a pre-med course. So a pre-med course, the program that I went through is the same as a pre-med where okay. you are put into a biomedical science. You learn the basics of science. Mm. After you qualify, you apply, you go do medicine for four years. That is what VET is doing. But VET has both programs. Mm. But what they are doing, if you apply to medicine, for medicine at VET, and you don't get accepted the first time, that is it with you. At VET, they will say, mm. go do a degree. Once you are finished, you can apply to enter as a graduate, right? Mm. And I mean, there are many universities. There's KZN, Free State, Stellenbosch, Cape Town, um, uh, UP, VETS, uh, SMU, Formanum, 
as Medunza that one can apply to. So that would be my best advice that, you know, in one institution you can apply for medicine as your first choice. Then maybe you say physiotherapy or dentistry in the other institution. But you need to know in all these choices, if you say nursing here, there and there, that will you love it at the end? Should you end up going with that? Like I said, I was very tired after BSc. I didn't want to do medicine anymore because it can happen. And you need to be comfortable with the decision that you've made at that point to say, if this is the end, then I'm going to have to live with this. So was that the, the medical school available you wanted to speak about? Come again? Is that what you wanted to speak about, the, medical, the availability of medical schools? Yes. No. To, oh, no, no, no. That, that, that's not that. I um, what, what, I, no. yes. what, what I wanted to say about that is that, um, you know, since 1994, uh, when we took over the government, I mean, I, I don't think you know of any other medical school that has been built. No. Mm. So that is the problem. Bumalanga, what university did they build? There's no medical school there. No. That university Bumalanga. they opened it was no. in Bumalanga, ne? Yeah, two years ago or is it three years ago? You mean um, in, in Pulukwane? Oh, is it Pulukwane? Pulukwane, oh, yes. Pulukwane. No, it, it's yes. still in the process. It's not running yet. Oh, so yeah. they're, they're still trying to build an academic hospital. And you are right, two years ago or so, yeah, yeah. it is still in the channels. It's not done yet. But basically, the, the bottom line is that in the past, not too, especially black people, not too many people were qualifying to go into medicine. And it was easier to say those who are performing well will take them. But now, even our high schools in the rural areas, uh, kids are performing so well that the applications are coming in numbers and we don't have enough medical schools. Mm -hmm. That is why the standard is getting higher and higher. And we also don't have enough hospitals. If you look at the number of big, I'm talking about big, I mean, big centers, Mm. that have been uh, built since then, mm. like academic hospitals, mm. so to say, that can train doctors. Because can. it's good to have, be, uh, to build these other district hospitals mm. or regional hospitals. They can take care of the community, but they can't train doctors. So that's what I wanted to say, to just say, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's something that our government, I hope they are looking into for all these years that, you know, we need more medical schools. Mm -hmm. That is why some, they have had this plan where they are sending students to train in Cuba because we don't have enough medical schools in the country. And we need more medical school. We need more academic hospitals that can train doctors. Um, So we don't need NHI. We need more medical. (laughs) 100%. We don't need NHI. We need more medical school in order to have... Because then the other thing is that we've got doctors who have finished and they don't have jobs. Why do you think that is? It's because we don't have enough hospitals. We're still relying on the same hospitals and the same healthcare system that was built by the apartheid government. And these are very important things that as a nation we, we need to be considering and looking into. And who makes drugs? Do doctors, do you guys play a role in the creation of drugs? Or Actually, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the medication, drugs, medication, yeah. So the answer is yes and no. The no part is that the main people who are involved in making drugs are pharmacologists and pharmacists. These are scientists. So to do a pharmacology course, you're basically studying drugs. And it's a BSc degree. When you have finished that BSc degree, you are a scientist, as as, uh, you were saying earlier. You are a scientist in drugs. So then part you can choose what you want to do. You can work in a lab, a research lab, where you're just working in manufacturing and uh, new drugs and mm. whatnot, you know, we've got COVID and all other diseases that mm. comes up. So those are the guys, they, also the pharmacists, those, those ones, they, 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 they train, they are trained to learn and understand how medi- medi- medication works. So, and they are also uh, scientists, right? So you can choose as a pharmacologist, as a pharmacist, do you want to open your own 
pharmacy, you work there, you work in terms, or as a pharmacologist, do you want to be a representative of a certain company that, let's say Pfizer, and then you are a representative, you go to hospitals, you tell them about these new drugs, you go to media, you tell them about these new drugs that we think this works and whatnot. So that's what the scientists do. But we as doctors, we are involved at, um, we are also involved, uh, but at a different level. So you've got, if we're talking about COVID and others, you've got physicians who are, that's why I said they're the smartest, yes, who are infectious disease doctors. So if we're talking about an outbreak, the physicians who are uh, infectious disease specialists, they are the ones who mainly who are going to be in, in the front um, in terms of leading the new research because you can't just make drugs if you don't understand the human body. Mm. And if you just understand the human body, you need the guys who understand drugs much better. Mm. So we work in collaboration, doctors, pharmacists, and pharmacologists. And as a doctor as well, you know, you can decide that I just want to work in a university, do teaching and focus on research. Whatever research uh, project you, you can choose to do, and part of it can be research in new drugs and whatnot. Oh. You know, pharmaceutical companies are the ones that are in the front. They employ doctors, they employ pharmacists, they employ pharmacologists, and all the role players who are involved uh, in, in, in terms of manufacturing new, new medicines and drugs. Oh. That's interesting, huh? So the legacy that you would want to leave behind as a doctor, because I know you've shown that you do have a passion of wanting to teach kids and whatnot. So yes, just the final one, your legacy as a doctor, what would it be? As I hear, you also want to maybe also maybe open up a hospital. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be too much of a bad I, idea. I, I, I wish I had that much money to open my own hospital. But yeah. It, it will hopefully get to that sometime in the future in terms of group practices and whatnot. It's a little bit better when you're a group of doctors, but you have to rely on banks to get loans and whatnot. Usually when we finish, uh, almost all of us, we are looking. Uh, it depends. Some people, they finish and they just want to go do private work and make a lot of money. That is where the money is. And... That is why uh, NHI is not going to be welcomed, especially by private doctors and the medical aid schemes. That's a debate for another day. Um, but for someone like me, I want to do both private and public work. And the reason for that is I want to be involved heavily in academics. And one of these days in the future where I see myself, I know you ask about legacy and this is a very big part of legacy. I see myself heading a spine unit sometime in the near future. Wow. And I see myself heading an orthopedic division sometime in the near future. I don't know where it will be, whether it will be in Kauteng, Limpopo or wherever, but I've, I've, I've learned a lot of things and I've seen a lot of things where we can improve and sometimes when you are a little fish in a large pond your views are not had but I'm definitely staying in, in states because in terms of academic teaching and you know the programs there's a lot of things that I feel can be improved across South Africa um, and how we can spread awareness, how we can make our training better, and how we can convince more doctors to stay in the States. And yeah, it is, it, it is my passion to say that's where I see myself. And the legacy that I'm going to leave behind, it's most likely to be, um, it's most likely going to be rooted from that uh, in my journey to get to that point wherein I will be able to have much more influence in the teaching and the training of medical students and specialists, and also in how 
the orthopedic departments are ran. And it's not just going to be orthopedic departments. You know, there is a new culture that is coming up. As I said, that mm. the guys in the past they had their own style of training mm. students and Being specialists. And, and yeah. most of us who are growing now, we are seeing things differently. The only and the biggest challenge is that most of us, when we finish and we see the money in private, because mm. if, if I stay in public and I just do public work, I can tell you that my spine colleague in one weekend or one day, he can make the same amount that I, in one weekend, so to say, he can make the same amount that I'm making in a month in a hospital. So... Mm. In, in, in the States. So you look at that and you're like, okay, if I just stay here, you know, we so need to empower better. ourselves yeah. as, as the people and not just to empower ourselves for our own benefits, um, but for those around us, for the communities where we come from, you know, the rural areas where we come from and to make sure that we can affect change. You can only affect change if you have money. Mm. And if you finish and you stay in a place where According to your question earlier on, are you being paid enough? Mm. And the answer is no. You know, you're teaching students, you're teaching uh, specialists, you're working, you're doing all these sort of things. And you know the state is so burdened with so many patients, mm. like 80% of mm. people, they get treatment in states. Mm. And you're getting paid 10% in a month of what your colleagues in private are getting. Mm. You're not going to get anywhere. You know, you can make mm. noise all you like, but you also need money. In order to have yeah. voice and to to make a change. Hmm. Last one. Uh, do you think that you could be replaced by robots in, as you would say, like artificial intelligence in doing the actual operations? So the answer is, Hell it's no. yes and no. Oh. Um, no, because robots are programmed to do certain things. We are using robots as it is to operate even in spine, mm. but not to say that the robot is doing the actual operation. The, the, the robot is assisting you to see better and to do your operation better. And I'm, I'm saying yes, because you don't know with technology, these engineers are just coming up with new things over and over. But this goes back to the statement I made much earlier on um, about decision-making being the most powerful tool of a doctor, mm. that if you don't make the right decisions, you're going to be a dangerous doctor. Mm. So when you are operating, you know what you're going to do, but situations can change when you're mm. in there and you need to adapt. But if you have a robot doing the operation, and there's no one monitoring it, it's going to do what you told it to do that. Okay. The bone is here and there when put mm. it together. If something happens and something change, and because you, although we have all these investigation tools, things do change during the operation and circumstances change and you need to adapt. And that is one part that I feel the robots will always fall short. In spine, we can put in cameras into the spine to help us operate. We've got machine, instead of just looking at the X-ray, we've got machine that you can put it in there. It scans the whole patient. And then it tells you the direction of the screws, the direction of everything that you're going to put in there so that when you're putting them in, as long as the robot, everything is still well-placed, it will tell you you're going the right direction. You're going the right direction, you know. And it's, it's much, much better than how we were doing things in the past. And some of them, we call them minimal invasive operation. Mm -hmm. No one wants a large scar anymore after the yeah. operation. So you make a small cut, another small cut, you put two portals. With the other portal, you can do your operation. With the other portal, you've got a camera so that you've got like a small... So that's where artificial intelligence is helping us at the moment. But I don't know if it will get to a point where it will decide I'll, I'll do this operation. That will be very difficult to adapt. There will be a lot of problems. Oh. Oh. Oh, thank you. All right, beautiful people of the world, there you have it. If anyone is looking to become a doctor or a scientist, here is a good example of how you should do it and how you should go about it. I hope I've educated someone's curious mind and Dr. Chris as well, of course. I hope we've educated your curious minds. I hope we can see more doctors in the future.
let there be more doctors, let there be more medical schools. Guys, can we raise awareness on this? It could save a life or many lives for that matter. And yeah, please don't forget to like, share, comment on what you would like us to talk about next. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe. This is your boy Scotty, signing out. But, 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 but.